miracle has taken place. A lame man is raised uh, to his feet, and it's all in the name of Jesus, of course. And in the explanation of that great miracle, he was, uh, had been there begging, of course, for over 40 years. And in the, uh, in the aftermath of that great miracle, he's hanging on to Peter, and they're in the, uh, port, in the porch, uh, Solomon's porch. And Peter is giving a great exhortation about uh, an, an explanation, actually, of what is taking place and what uh, is going to be uh, for their lives. And he says it all happened by faith. And in verse 16, you get the highlight of that. Uh, It's in His name, through faith in His name. And we know, of course, that faith is invoking the activity of the second party so that basically what's going on is that Jesus has been called upon the scene. And you can't invite Jesus to come upon the scene without Him coming. And when He comes, you can expect that He's going to do the phenomenal kinds of things that His presence does. And so it's all in invoking the activity of the second party. I want to invoke the activity of Jesus in my life. I know that full well that's going to mean change. I understand that. It's going to mean alteration. It will probably give me new ideas, new thoughts. I'm going to have to alter things, change things here and there. He and himself will do some of that change. But he's asking me to respond to his presence. And I'm willing to do that. So this is not a churchy thing. This is not uh, come and adjust here. This is not an attitude check. This is deeper than that. It's the invitation of a real person to come and invade your life. And in that invasion, there will be radical, overwhelming change at the depth of your life, spilling through all of your activities. And that's what's taken place in this man's life. In fact, through this faith, Peter says he has perfect soundness. (laughs) Woo, wouldn't that be great to have perfect soundness in your life? (laughs) Oh, you don't think so. Okay. Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> he, in this faith activity and in the demonstration of this great miracle, uh, he is calling them to repent, which is verse 19 of chapter 3. So basically, we're looking at verse 19, verse 20, and verse 22, or verse 21, rather. Those three verses make up one amazing sentence. And we started uh, last week, well, a couple weeks ago, I guess, uh, looking at this one sentence, trying to work our way through it. And it's a call to repentance. So I want you to get the scene. The lame man healed in perfect soundness is standing right here. And he's a testimony, a demonstration to a call to repentance. Isn't it interesting that this lame man being healed is really a setup for the whole crowd? And you could easily look at it and say, well, God really wasn't interested in the lame man, although he was, but he was using the lame man for the whole crowd. So it wasn't this individual, it was this 5,000 men that are going to get saved out of this whole thing. So God is setting this whole thing up. So he did this in order to do this, in order to get this done for this to happen. So is God interested in your life? Yes, but dear people, do you understand? He's doing this in your life so that this can take place, so he can get this done, which is going to bring this about. And there's big stuff happening. So this is not some isolated deal underneath my left rib. This is a really a big deal that God is going to move a whole town, a whole temple, a whole city over this lame man. And this lame man is the demonstration of this whole thing. So here's this whole crowd that's looking at this lame man and said, Woo, maybe we should repent. Why? Well, based on what just happened in his life. So this is a call to repentance out of a man's life, which is phenomenal, which is how God wants to use you. Now, repentance, we understand, is giving up a former thought to embrace a new thought. And so he is calling us to that. And obviously, that's what these Jews need to do. They have criticized Jesus for being a blasphemer. They have looked at him and said, you are of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. That's the way you cast out demons. So, hey, we know who you are. Now they're going to have to give up that former thought to embrace the new thought of, oh, my, he is not a blasphemer. He is the truth. I am the truth. They obviously have looked at Jesus and said he is a lawbreaker. He breaks the laws of God. It was really their oral interpretation. The Sabbath day laws heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. They've criticized him for that. They went after him for that. Now they're going to have to come and say, "Woo! he is the fulfillment of, of the law and in him all comes together 
they have looked at him, of course, and said, he is, I, we will not accept him as the sacrifice. We're going to maintain our own sacrifices, do our own churchy thing, operate out of our own lambs, do our, do our stuff. Our budget depends on it. Now they're going to have to embrace him as the sacrifice, and all of church activity is going to change. Wow. <laughs> I'm for it. <laughs> Aren't you? All of that is taking place. They have looked at him, of course, as one who is the, not the Messiah. They are now going to have, have to embrace him as the Savior and their Messiah. This is a radical change, this call to repentance. And be converted, which is a turning to. And we've dealt with that. Now, as you look at verse 19, repent therefore and be converted, which is the verb, the two main verbs, and they're in the imperative, and the subject, of course, is the assumed you, which is talking about you. Then he starts into these purpose clauses. Now, there are two purpose clauses that we're dealing with, and we dealt with one last Sunday, that your sins may be blotted out. Oh, wish I hadn't preached that last Sunday. I'd like to do it today. That your sins may be blotted out. The word that is really the word in, to. It's ace in the Greek language, so it's literally in to. So it's the, hey, repent and be converted so you can move into. And into is a state of existence. In other words, you can't get into, we pictured it as a room over here, and you're going to move into that room. We understand you can't get into that room without going through the door. And, of course, in Christianity, in evangelical Christianity, we call the door getting saved, being born again, whatever term you want to use in that, in the, in that framework is okay. So that's the door. But the goal of Christianity is not the door. The goal of Christianity is the room. So this is not just about being saved. Oh, yes, I got my badge, my button, and, or I got my certificate or whatever. See, this is not an event that you go through, and we stressed this last week. This is not just an experience at an altar. It is, of course, and that experience at the altar is great, and we're not undermining that. We're only saying that, hey, that's an entrance into a bigger deal. So you are to repent and be converted so you can go through the door and get into the room. And obviously, it's a change of location, which is the word into. You are to move into the room where sins are blotted out and guilt is gone. This is a new location. And the location is the person of Jesus. You are moving into him. That's all over the scriptures, folks. Woo! It is all over the scriptures that you are to actually live in Christ. And Christ is actually to live in you. And in that location, you have sins blotted out. So Christianity, sins blotted out, guilt removed is a relational thing whereby you and him are together in the same place. And in that embrace, you move around in your world in a state of no guilt, sins being removed. Hey, everything is, it's, it's his presence. It's awesome. Now, that's the first purpose clause. Now, where we want to go today, oh, this is so phenomenal, is this. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Comma. And then he moves on in verse 20 and 21, which is a continuation of this one purpose clause. So this is a really lengthy purpose clause. So we're going to break it down into uh, four parts, I think it is. But anyhow, we're starting with the first part today. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Um, I want to start with the idea of the agency of repentance. Now, you understand that the way you get into this room and get into these two purpose clauses is through repentance. Repentance is a response to what he's doing in my life. Repentance is not something I do to get him to act. He acts, and I respond in repentance. I'm incapable of repentance. I cannot possibly repent. I haven't got the ability to repent. I don't even want to repent until he comes. And when he comes and gives me, that's what he's done in the passage, you see. 
Here's a lame man who's standing here. A demonstration of what Jesus can do in the life. A perfect soundness going from what he was to what he is. Here is an example of what can take place. And this is being presented to all of these, this crowd of Jews. So this is, God is moving upon their lives. Word is coming to them. Peter is giving this phenomenal exhortation. And as all of this thunders into them and upon them, they are being called to respond. And if they will respond, the purpose clauses will become reality. So you don't need to worry about the purpose clauses. All you need to worry about is responding to him as he comes. Would you do this morning what your heart tells you to do? You can't miss. Now, as you move into it, it becomes very important that the first word, one of the very important words in the whole, in the whole structure is so that. In other words, he's introducing the second purpose clause with the word so that. It's the Greek word hopus. Hopus. And as you look at this word, you realize that it's different than the first purpose clause. So he's introduced the first purpose clause with into. Now he's come and in, introduced this second purpose clause differently. And the reason for that is that this second purpose clause is like a final purpose clause. So that. In other words, this is the end of it. In other words, this is the totality of what God wants for your life. In other words, you got into this state where your sins are blotted out and you are living in a state where guilt is removed and you're dwelling, you're living day after day, guiltless, blameless before him. Hallelujah. Isn't that enough? No, no. We're moving to the real purpose of this thing. The reason you've gotten into that state, the reason guilt is removed, the reason sin is cleansed is for a bigger and greater purpose. And I want you, he says, into that great purpose. Now, what is the great purpose, the final purpose that he wants us into? Well, the first word after that is the word times. Now, this is going to be a little technical, which is going to bother some of you. So just uh, take a deep breath and track with me on this because this, this is really important. Walk your way through this. Walk your way through this with me. In the actual Greek language, there is a little word, an, A-N. It's not equivalent to our word, an. It's a Greek word. And the word is put there. It's not translated in your translation. No translation translates it because it doesn't need to be translated. What the word does is it makes what it's referring to an uncertainty. This really bothered me. This really bothered me. It makes it a maybe. It makes it an uncertainty. It might take place. It might not take place. So it's addressing the times, times of refreshment. And this little word, and, goes at the beginning of this, like times of refresh, refreshment. Well, is it guaranteed? No. Is it certain? No. Oh, this is awful, isn't it? I don't like that. See, obviously, the times of refreshment is, to, is referring to Jesus bathing my life in his presence, and that should be a certainty, shouldn't it? And yet he uses this word and, so I really struggled with this. I mean, wow, how could this be? On top of that, as you walk on, you realize that the main verb in, the, in this clause is may be. And may be is in the subjunctive. And the subjunctive is maybe uncertainty. So good night. We're getting it twice. That the times of refreshings, we're not sure whether they will, whether they won't. It's at the beginning of the statement, and it's at the close of the statement. So we're coming at it from both ends, and the whole thing is up for grabs. So this is like, woo, I hope they do. Maybe we'll be blessed this morning. Maybe we won't. Maybe his refreshment will be in our lives. Maybe it won't. It's all in the maybe state. Why don't we just say amen, go home? That's awful, isn't it? Isn't that discouraging? See, I want to come and say, hey, this is God's promise, and and you're in. See, that's what I want. I don't want the maybe. See, I'm not into that. And yet it's all over this thing. 
Maybe there'll be times of refreshment. Maybe there won't. Maybe you'll get into it. Maybe you won't. It's all in the uncertainty of it. Then you come to the word times. Now, the word times is really important here because the word times is keros, and there's another word for times, which is uh, krosmos. It is a word that speaks about periods of time, like teenage period. That's a period of time. But that's not our word here. Our word here focuses on the idea of an opportune time. In other words, it's a moment of opportunity. That what you're being stared with this morning is that you have, there is a parting of things that has brought you to a phenomenal opportune moment that things have put been put into place that have brought you to a particular moment in your life where wow it's an opportune time how many times do opportunities show up maybe maybe not sometimes sometimes not well i have an opportunity maybe you will Maybe you won't. When will that happen? Will it be today? Maybe. Maybe not. So the opportune moment is the emphasis of this, of this statement. This is a moment of opportunity. Now, put that into our passage. What do you have? Here stands a lame man. He's just been healed. He's in perfect soundness. He's demonstrating the wonder of the faith in Christ and what that can do. When the presence of Jesus, when you step into this room, whoo, look what takes place. 5,000 Jews, over 5,000 Jews are being confronted with a moment, an opportune moment. Wouldn't it be interesting if this whole last month, the month of August, has brought you to this final Sunday of August and everything has set the stage to bring you here and some of you came when you didn't even want to. Wouldn't it be interesting if it's an opportune moment? <laughs> Well, I've come other Sundays and it was an opportune moment. I know. Didn't come together for me then. What if? What if? What if? Times, opportune moments. Now, that brings us to the next statement, which we're calling the air of refreshment. And as you look at this statement, it's referring to times of refreshment. Whew, that sounds like diet seven up, doesn't it? Wow. I mean, times of refreshment may come. So the whole gospel he's presenting to us in the, in the context of a refreshing. Here's an opportune moment, and what, what will this opportune moment bring you into? Oh, refreshing. Now, track with me on this. See, it isn't the refreshing that's a maybe. It's the opportune moment. See, isn't, it isn't that his presence giving refreshment will be a maybe, uncertain. Maybe his presence will come and then it'll go and maybe I'll be refreshed or maybe I won't. No, it's not that. It's that the opportune moment is the maybe. Let me ask you, how many chances do you deserve? Let's not answer that one, huh? How many times... Should I get a chance? 
In speaking about missions, for instance, it has been proposed that those who have heard the gospel do not have a right to ever hear it again until everybody's heard it. How many chances have you had? How many opportune moments have been laid out before you? Startling, isn't it? And it all focuses on the idea of the refreshment. Now, when you deal with the refreshment idea, you go back to, and this is on your notes, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. You go back to the things that Jesus had to say when he was talking about, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is, he's describing the Jews, who are these Jews right here. When you're describing the Jews, the state they were in was labor and heavy laden. I whack you on the back. How you doing? Man, I'm tired. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm tired. What's the problem? Worked hard this week. Why'd you work so hard? Well, I just, a lot of pressure, a lot of things to do. And it wasn't just my job. There was stuff at home, and then I got, and then I had to, and then I went over, and then I, and then, and the fair. <laughs> well, no wonder you're tired. Just looking at that line of traffic makes me tired. Are you weary? Are you worn out? Well, yeah. But it isn't hard work that wears us out. Hard work is good. Coming from a preacher, that says a lot, doesn't it? He's never worked a day in his life. Hard work, yeah. Hard work isn't what wears you out. Well, what wears you out? Oh, it's all of this complexity it's this it's this drama it's this upset it's this pressure it's this confusion it's this it's this it's this what's going to happen and anxiety and depression and just drives me crazy i just whoa i can't sleep at night and i just just what are you going to do with all of that stuff See, that, that's what we're, see, they were heavy laden. You know why these Jews were heavy laden? For them, it was the legalism of the law. They had all this stuff they'd had to meet up to, and there were 613 of the oral interpretation besides the law of God. And when you got it all together, it was wear you out, brother, just to try to figure out what you can do and what you can't do. And the thing about legalism, it's so contradictory because when you just get legalism figured out, oh, I can do that, you discover that doing that contradicts this law over here here which said you could do you couldn't do that and you just look at this thing for instance my dad my dad said you cannot it is against the law of God and the Bible to take a Sunday paper why well because a paper boy has to deliver that paper and then he can't come to church and you're damning his soul Ooh, pretty strong, isn't it? It was okay to take a Monday paper. However, we never calculated that a Monday paper is printed on Sunday. <laughs> isn't that confusing? See, that's the difficulty with laws. That it gets so complicated, it just drives you. These Jews were driven to the wall on this stuff. And there was no way. They lived consistently in a state of guilt that I'm never quite, well, I, I never match, I never, I, I'm never, I never go up to, I'm never what I, I, I never do it. I never quite ever. Whew. Are you what you ought to be? No. Do you do the right thing? Not all the time. Do you preach long enough? No, seldom. No amens on that. So, you know, you, did, you just never, ever quite 
well, I should have prepared more. I could have prayed more. Oh, I should have read my Bible more. I just, oh. you know, my devotions weren't long enough. Hey, I could have witnessed to them and I didn't. See, they lived in that. And folks, that wears you out. Absolutely wears you out. In fact, when Jesus looked at him in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, he said, and when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he saw them as just wandering in confusion. And he just, that was these Jews. Do you have any of those kind of feelings? Like if life could just come together, if I could just get out of this mess, if I could just get out of this pressure, if things could just smooth off, smooth off. If I could just be refreshed. See, that's the context of the refreshment. The actual Greek word for refreshment means breathing or refreshment after being heated from labor. In other words, you've been in this hot, blistering sun. You work like a dog. You're sweating all over. And there comes this moment of 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 refreshment it's just you know the old Lipton tea advertisement on TV where the guy just oh, in the pool <laughs> oh refreshment wouldn't it be something just to take your life and just whoo back in the arms of Jesus and let it all go <laughs> oh, oh refreshment refreshment the Bible talks about it in terms of oh, there's this artesian well burning boiling up inside of me just refreshing my life just spilling through my being just Oh, that's what he's talking about. Anybody for that? Anybody for that? It's like I've been on a long journey, man, and I'm home. It's like coming home. Just like. John talked about in terms of you've been in darkness. It's the dungeon of darkness and you step into the light. You see for the first time. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? It's the cool breeze of his presence. Who wouldn't want that? So he's saying to these Jews, man, you've been struggling. You've been all into the legalism. You've been offering the sacrifice lambs. You've been doing all the stuff. You ended up crucifying Christ. You did the wrong thing, man. Here's a lame beggar, brother. Here's a lame beggar that God is, he's the worst of your group. I mean, you don't even include him in your group. That's how low he is. God has moved upon him's life and giving perfect soundness. He's an example of what I'm talking about. His life has been put together. Listen, would you just repent, move into the state of existence whereby sin is gone, sins are blotted out, sins are cleansed, guilt is removed, and you stand in the presence of God and his refreshment, his artesian well presence, he bathes you in the wonder of the pressures of life are pushed aside. Well, preacher, how long is that going to last? Oh, the promise, folks, is that that's where you dwell. Oh, I want you to understand this. Because some of you, your lives are really chaotic. Not mine, of course. For some of us, there's all this drama. We didn't even create it. For some of us, there's all of this, this, this the circumstances and stuff and finances and relationships and all this stuff going on, and it's just, it's just absolutely mind-boggling. And we, we live, 
Do you think it's possible in the middle of that kind of chaos and drama to live in a state where the refreshing, whoa, just fall back, just, and you could live in a state of existence of refreshment in the middle of a chaotic scene of life. I think that probably would keep me from committing suicide. Might not even kill my wife. One of the uh, first things that happened to me in the ministry, this would have been, what, 1840s, but um, (laughs) I went to this guy and I said, do you have any advice this old-timer, I went to this old-timer, uh, which is probably a message to you to stay away from old-timers, but anyhow. Uh, I went to him and said, do you have any advice for a, a young upstart? And consistently, everyone I talked to all said this, be careful about burnout. Don't burn out. Don't burn out. So, what, what do you mean? Don't burn out. Don't get so involved and get so busy, you get burnt out, burnt out. One of the things about church is you just get burnt out. You just, you just get so involved and you just get, it's just, you'll just get burnt out. You'll get so involved in preaching and evangelism and all this and, uh, 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 I quit. <laughs> you know, you get burnt out. It is, I can't take it anymore. I just, it's just too much pressure. Interesting, all these years. Just think about this. I've never had anybody come to me and say, oh, I'm so excited about the presence of Jesus. Oh, he just bathes me in his presence. Oh, I'm telling the refreshment of God in my life. I'm telling the joy and the peace and the wonder of his presence, and it's just expanding in my life daily. Boy, am I burnt out. I've never had anybody say that. I've never had anybody say, oh, the word of God is fresh in my life. Do you know what I found right over here? Let me explain it to you. Wow, it's phenomenal. It's going to change my life forever. Uh, The word of God is coming alive to me. And I just, oh, and I'm into the word. And Jesus is just so, and I'm so excited about it. Oh, am I burnt out? I think I'll quit. Somehow, that all doesn't. That what he's talking about in the passage, it has to do with this overwhelming, refreshing, oh, you got to focus on Jesus. Hey, you got to get into Jesus, man. That the refreshment is not found in the church. The refreshment is not found in, in, in the services. This is not about entertainment. This is not, boy, our worship is. This is not about, well, the preaching. This is, this is about, oh, his presence, the wonder. I've moved into a room. There's no guilt here. Sin is gone. Wow, I'm free. I don't have any law to measure up to. I embrace him, and he becomes the boundaries of my life, and it's just like falling back into the wonder of his presence. It's just, whoa, and he just bathes me in his greatness and in his peace, and it in that, I can, I, all the chaos out here is, well, yeah. Got to have this, Jesus. And Lord, what we didn't have time to get into was that all of this, it says, comes from your presence because we're dwelling in the place of your presence. And Lord, we want to take our discouragement today and we want to bring it in the middle of your presence and let you refresh us with the wonder of who you are. We want to take all the drama and all the upset in our lives, God, And we just want to drag it in here into your presence 
And we want to dwell in the midst of your... We want to take all the confusion and all the wonder and all of the how we going to and all, of the, and all of the uncertainty of life and we want to drag it in here, oh God. And we want to bring it all into the middle of your... And we just want you to bathe us. We just want... Oh God, could you just... Jesus, could you become surreal in our life? Jesus, could you become the constant companion? Jesus, could you become the room in which we dwell? Jesus, could you become our new location? Jesus... Jesus, could we repent today? Could we repent, give up all the former thought of depending on ourselves? And could we embrace you? And could you be the consistent, constant refreshment, your presence refreshing us in the midst of a chaotic world? Lord, I want to ask you for one thing this morning. I'd like for you to bring overwhelming refreshment to everybody's life in this sanctuary. Maybe they won't have it tomorrow, but I want you to do it today. As some have just struggled to even get here and be here, with all the difficulties of life, would you just, would you just, this moment, would you just be, and would you tell them that this is a taste of what you want to be in them all the time? Heads are bowed. Oh, you got to embrace him. You got to know him. Come on, you got to go deeper with him, man. Come on, folks. There is a dwelling place, it's the heart of Jesus. You in him. And him in you that is the refreshing place. It is the cool breeze. It is the artesian well. It is the constant energizing. It is the sourcing of. And when there is heat all around and battle and strife and misunderstanding and upset everywhere at the core of your life that makes you who you are. Oh, rest. Rest. Refreshment. See, the maybe is on whether you'll experience this or not. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. But if you get in the room, if the change of location takes place, heads are bowed, I want to invite you to bring the chaos, the upset, the pressure, the battle. Hey, no embarrassment. We live in a chaotic world. Would you crawl with me into his presence? Would you let him just bathe you in the flow of his person. Is this an opportune moment? For you. Have the circumstances of life. 
created a scene where there's a lame man standing who's literally been transformed by Jesus. Setting up a platform by which he speaks to you and calls you in an opportune moment to dwell in the refreshing of His presence. This is not intimidation. This is invitation. This is not criticism. Condemnation. This is the wonder of come to me. Listen to him, will you? Be obedient.